Welcome to Soul Medication, your weekly biblical encouragement, the podcast that nourishes your soul and strengthens your faith through the timeless wisdom of God's Word. I'm your host, Michelle Brooks, and I'm honored to be your guide as we delve into the transformative power of Scripture. Each week, we'll open the pages of the Bible and explore the purposes, direction, and guidance that God has for us. Together, we'll study the principles that can shape our daily lives and bring us closer to our Creator. As we embark on this journey, we'll seek the Holy Spirit's guidance and pray so that we may truly understand and apply God's truth in our lives. Whether you're a seasoned believer or just beginning your spiritual journey, Soul Medication is here to uplift and inspire you. Together, let's find solace in God's Word, find strength in His promises, and find hope in His unfailing love. Subscribe to Soul Medication on your favorite podcast platform and join our community of faith-filled individuals who are seeking biblical encouragement and spiritual growth. Let's open our hearts and minds to the transformative power of God's Word as we walk together on this journey of faith. Good morning. Happy Monday. I'm so excited and blessed to be back here bringing you encouragement from God's Word. Welcome to another episode of Soul Medication. I'm your host, Michelle, and I am bringing you your dose of biblical encouragement for the day. And today we are going to begin an exciting look at the Gospel of John. And I love starting at the beginning of something and seeing where God will lead us. So being Ash Wednesday this past week, I felt God leading me to a series that will follow Jesus through the Gospel of John to the cross. I can't wait for the new things that God will show us. And I've already seen some great things I'll share this week with you. Um, His spirit always guides us into all truth and is always revealing new things about the father that we may not have seen. But first, let's ask for God to bless our time together. Heavenly Father, I pray that as we look at your word today, your Holy Spirit would guide us into all truth as he brings us the things of you and your desires for us. Open our hearts and minds and give us a desire to want to do your will even when our earthly desires are stronger. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Principle number one in John is the word. It's the first thing we see. So let's look at Jesus in character as the word with a capital W. If you are going to follow along with our devotional over the next eight episodes, I would recommend reading John 1 through 3 this week because that's what we're covering today. In chapter one, we see the word. Notice how John starts. What are the first three words? In the beginning. And where have we seen this before? We see it in Genesis. The same God that created the world, that hovered over the waters, that created us, is the same God that is the word, from the Greek word logos, which points to Christ such as one representing the gospel. So the first thing we note here is Jesus presented as the word. We see the pre-existence and the very nature of God in Jesus. In John 1, 1, it says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So it's very clear here that Jesus was in the beginning with God, and he's the written expression of God. He is the physical manifestation. And in Revelations 22, verse 13, Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. And here again, we see God expressed as letters. And you need letters to make words. And we see him reveal the Father. Who better to reveal the Father but the one that said in John 14, 9, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Matthew Henry's commentary says the plainest reason why the son of God is called the word seems to be that as our words explain our minds to others, so was the son of God sent in order to reveal his father's mind to the world. Then we see John relating to Jesus as the life and the light. And in verse four, we see the first reference in this book of John relating to Jesus as the source of life. In him was life and his life was the light of men. His light shines in the darkness, but the darkness doesn't understand it. 
And then we're introduced to John the Baptist, who is sent, according to Malachi 3.1, where God tells us he will send his messenger. And when he arrived, hope arrived because he was preaching about the light of the world to come. And then we see Jesus coming to earth in the flesh. We see that Jesus came to earth and became flesh. And John the Baptist testifies that this is the one. This is the one that was before me and goes back to when time began. He ranks above me. And John the Baptist had a difficult calling that he was to prepare the heart of Israel for the coming Messiah, calling them to repent and be baptized. In verse 29, it says, the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and he said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Our first identification of someone in the crowd that is the Messiah, their Redeemer, and for an Israelite, this Messiah was the coming King who would deliver them and establish his kingdom. And this Lamb was not just any Lamb, but the Paschal Lamb. This was the first lamb sacrificed when God brought his people out of Egypt. The very first Passover lamb, the blood on the doorpost. Can you imagine the head turns, the exclamations? Where is he? Where is he? Who's he talking about? Who's John talking about? They're looking for their coming king and all they see is this young carpenter. But John went on, this is the one I meant when I said, a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Another reference to Jesus being before John. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. And John the Baptist continues to testify how he knew that this was God's chosen one when he saw the spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. So at this point, the people have a choice to believe John or not. And he doesn't just stop there. The next day, John was there again in verse 35 with two of his disciples. He had disciples. And when he saw Jesus passing by, he said for the second time now, look the lamb of God. I can imagine the heads turn, the crowds murmuring, the questioning, okay, is John onto something here or has he been eating too many locusts? But When John's two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? Jesus doesn't wait for them to say anything. He asks them directly, have you thought about that? What if Jesus asked you, what do you want? What would your reply be? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replies, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. So what do you think they did for that day? What would you do? I can't even think of the first question, but I know I would feel his presence and his love. I know I would sense his compassion and his character, and I know I would want to linger there as long as I could. This was the one that was to redeem me, to make all the junk in my life worth it, to take all the junk in my life, remove it, heal my life, heal my mind, my body, and my spirit, and fill me with the abundant life to the overflowing. And I believe that I would want to just linger. I'd pull a Mary. How many of you would pull a Mary and just forget everything else in the world and sit at the feet of Jesus? Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who had heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. And the first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we found the Messiah, that is the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. And Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter or a rock. In verse 43, it says the next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee and finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip found Nathanael and told him we found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael says, Nazareth, can anything good come from there? And I think Philip gave the perfect answer to this comment meant to be discriminatory. He says, come and see. So Nathaniel follows Philip to check out this Jesus. When Jesus saw Nathaniel approaching, he said of him, here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Here's a question. If this was you walking toward Jesus, 
what would he be saying to you? Would he be saying, what a person of fine character you are? How do you know me? Nathaniel asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You're the king of Israel. And Jesus says, you believe because I told you, I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. He then added, verily, verily, or very truly, truly, I tell you, you will see the heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the son of man. Now here, the verily, verily, and it, it's only seen in the book of John, and it's only when Jesus is talking, and it's interpreted to mean that God was revealing a significant truth here, and it would be very wise to pay attention. There's a ladder, direct access to heaven, to the Father, and help, angels coming to and from the Father, and us as believers, because Jesus came having that access to the Father and bringing us this very same access. What a way to close that first chapter of John, where we're introduced to the very first Passover lamb. So chapter one, we saw the word of the Locos, the life and the light in the Passover lamb. And now let's look at chapter two. And what a way to open, but with the first miracle. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, mother, Jesus' mother came and said to him, They have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, My hour has not yet come. Now, Jesus is just beginning his ministry. He's not yet chosen all his disciples, but he kicks off his ministry with a wedding. He knew where he was going. He knew the cross was ahead, but he did not come to disrupt life and society, but he was in the middle of it. And Mary's concern over the lack of wine makes us think that this may have been a close relative. Another thing is what he says to her, the term mother or woman here is the same term, the same way that he addresses her when he is on the cross. We know that he didn't have any sin in him. So this was not a disrespectful tone or comment. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing. Hold that thought. Each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. And then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. There was no taste test, but they did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and he says, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink, but you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. The first miracle we hear of in John is conversion, conversion of the water to wine. Let's think about this for a minute. What was one of the first miracles of Moses? He turned the waters of the rivers to blood. And here we see Jesus' first miracle was turning water into wine. And what a contrast, because by the end of this book, Jesus will symbolize his blood poured out for us through lifting a cup of wine. John is recording here the first evidence of the divine glory of God dwelling within Christ. The fact that Jesus uses ceremonial cleansing jars to fill with water to turn into wine at a wedding feast has just been tugging at me all week. Every time I hear that phrase, it tugs. As we receive by faith, the sacrifice of the Lamb of God poured out for us. We are cleansed and we know we have a seat at the great wedding feast to come. And then in verse 13, we see principle number two, cleansing. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Verse 14, in the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep and doves and others sitting at tables exchanging money. Now at the same time as Passover, the people also were expected to pay their taxes, which is why there were so many money changers and most likely taking advantage of those who had to travel a distance and needed to buy animals for sacrifice and exchange money to pay taxes. And there could be over 2 million Jews, they, they say, at any given time coming in at this time to celebrate the Passover. So it was probably quite a scene. 
And Jesus' reaction was not an instantaneous flash of anger. He had time to contemplate what he was about to do. In verse 15, it says, So he made a whip out of cords and drove all the from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. Many believed he used the whip only to scatter the animals. And he scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. This area, this area of the temple where the market would have been, was the only place. It was the court of the Gentiles. It was the only place that the Gentiles could come to worship. And so the marketplace atmosphere with no doubt some dishonesty going on ruined the one place that non-Jews could gather and worship where the Jews would be gathering to witness and tell the Gentiles of the one true God. When I read this, this was the second wow. I thought, wow, I'd never thought of the idea of a Gentile coming into the courts of the temple in Israel to worship God. This was probably much like non-believers visiting our churches today. So it makes me think, what are we doing in our churches when non-believers gather with us. When the Jews asked Jesus for a sign to prove his authority to do all this, because he'd all just upturned all the tables and, and flailing his whip and chasing people out, they asked for some sign. And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. Remember that this very explanation is used against him later on. We'll see that. They replied, it's taken 46 years to build this temple and you're going to raise it in three days. But the temple he had spoken of was his body. And after he was raised from the dead, his disciples had recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that he had spoken. So chapter two starts with a conversion from water to wine. And then Jesus goes to the temple and cleanses the temple from the marketplace atmosphere, always in character with Christ. The conversion is first. The cleansing is after because we can never get clean enough to be converted. And again, I think of the significance of that water turned into wine in the ceremonial cleansing jars. Does that just resonate with you? In John chapter three, he uses four different analogies. He uses the first birth. Anyone that has memorized John 3.16 would probably be able to title John 3 as the chapter of the new birth. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. And this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. The new birth, Jesus is requiring something that man can simply never do himself. He can baptize himself, he can wash himself, but he can never birth himself. It's utterly impossible. So in order to see the kingdom of God, we see the impossible. And Nicodemus recognizes this abrupt change from being Israelites marching into the promised land as the chosen people to now having to be born again. And he asked the question any man would ask, how am I supposed to do that? How can that be? And the glory of the answer is that there is no way that we can, only Jesus can. And we begin to see some key verses about what it would take to be born again. And Jesus says in verse five that a man must be born of water and the spirit. And Nicodemus being a man of the Pharisees, would have known the scriptures. So the spirit is the second principle. We see the birth and the spirit. And so Nicodemus would have seen this. He would have known the scriptures and hearing this could probably see a connection with the words of Ezekiel 37, where the Lord had brought Ezekiel to the middle of the valley and it was full of dry bones, very dry bones. It was just death valley. And the Lord tells Ezekiel to prophesy to the bones and the bones begin to come to life. And the Lord tells him that these bones represent the entire house of Israel. And it is the word and the spirit that brings life. But Nicodemus is still questioning, how can this be? And Jesus proceeds to tell him how to have eternal life. And so we get to the third principle and he talks about Moses 
and how when they were in the wilderness and they were stricken with uh, illness and sickness, that Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. And he says, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son of man be lifted up that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. This would later be Christ lifted up on a cross for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So how did we get this born again status? How did we reap the benefits? How much work was it? We only need to believe one act of faith for God so loved. Now this is a huge moment for the Jews here. When Jesus said this to Nicodemus, who remember is this high level Pharisee, well-versed in the scriptures. And they believed that God only loved Israel. They were the chosen people. They were his favorites. And now this Jesus, their Messiah is saying that God loved the whole world. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world. The men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light because then his deeds would be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. This is the gospel. Principle number four, the light has come. This is the gospel. We have the birth. We have the spirit. We have Christ being lifted up on a cross and the coming of the light. And this is the world's response to the gospel. So as you reflect on Jesus' journey to the cross during this Lent season this week, let's meditate on the word. Let's meditate on Jesus, his coming to earth. Let's think about Jesus' first miracle, the conversion of the water to wine, the cleansing of the temple, and that conversion and cleansing take place in a specific order for a reason. And if we want to enter the kingdom of heaven, we must participate in the new birth. We must be born again or born of above. And this is nothing of our own doing, but by believing in Jesus Christ and who he was, he was God in the flesh. I pray that if you had not made that commitment to accept Jesus as your savior, to receive his gift of his death on the cross as payment for your sin, that you might do that today. Pray this week for God to reveal your true character to yourself, your faith, and open your eyes to the truth of his life here on earth, his purpose, which was to come and provide a sacrifice for you that could never have been provided or covered by any man. I hope that you will drop me a line and share with me how this podcast has blessed your life today. I hope that you've been encouraged today in your heart and your soul. In the meantime, if you're looking for a devotional for your quiet time, how well is your soul? A biblical journey towards spiritual wellness is available now through our website, soulmedication.com. So I hope that you take advantage of that today. The cost of my book is basically the cost of printing and shipping and handling. And also, if you're looking for a speaker for your women's event, reach out through my website as I am now booking events for this year. If you're on social media, please look for our social, our soul medication, Facebook or Instagram page, and give us a like and a follow as I'm working to try to get this message out to more and more people. Thank you for listening today. Please give me a like or leave a comment, share with your friends and subscribe to our podcast on your favorite platform. Have a wonderful week. Thank you so much for joining us for another episode of Soul Medication. I hope you found it encouraging and a spiritual lift to your soul. If you're enjoying these messages, I hope that you will hit the subscribe, hit the follow, the free, and share them with others. You can also leave us a review. Feel free to visit our website. The link is in the show notes. Follow us on social media at Soul Medication 2023 on Instagram or Soul Medication on Facebook. You can find lots of encouragement, challenges, and resources such as my new devotional, How Well Is Your Soul, available now on the website or from Amazon. Have a wonderful week and may God richly bless you.